Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word that was inspired by you. I thank you for your son who is the word, who gave his life on the cross and was resurrected for our sins, that we could live even though we die. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have taught us. Continue to teach us. Speak through me. Speak through this message, Lord God, that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are going through the seven miracles in John. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Lately in this life, it's felt like there's been a lot of darkness out there. There's been a lot of ups and downs, lefts and rights, all kinds of chaos in the media and the things that we're told on the day to day. Just the darkness seems to take over our minds at times. And I've told that it's just a conspiracy theory that there's no one plotting against us. They can't all be working together. But then I read in 1 Peter 5.8, be sober minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. So there is a plot for our demise, and it is the devil working on it. He is orchestrating it and keeping all these people working against God's good. He caused Adam to sin in the garden. He is very real and working for his own glory in our downfall. I, I would see others in turmoil a few years back, and I didn't understand that darkness. I was in a good place. I felt like I was protected through my faith. Things were going good, and though I could see people's pain and turmoil, it wasn't really affecting me until it started to. And then I'm reminded of the lyrics of Mandisa's song, Unfinished. I wasn't scared to say it. I used to be the one preaching it to you that you could overcome. I still believe it, but it ain't easy. Because the world I painted, where things just all work out, it started changing, and I started having doubts, and it got me so down. It says, but then I picked myself back up, And I started telling me, no, my God's not done making me a masterpiece. He's still working on me. But I had to acknowledge that. I had to understand it. I had to quit preaching at people that it's an easy fix because it's not. Sometimes they're in the darkest place you could ever imagine. Until you've been there, you don't know. And maybe you do. But try to empathize and hurt with them instead of telling them how to fix it. So even in the middle of the storm, we can be comforted through Christ. So I was going to sing Praise You in the Storm by Casting Crowns.
praise him in the storm, but if we read our Bibles, if we focus on the word, if we draw near to God, he'll show us how. He builds us up through turmoil and suffering. It's hard to understand, it's hard to explain that, but it's biblical and it's true. My grandma asked me if I was going to talk about Nathaniel from the book of John, so I decided I'd start there. <laughs> this is John chapter 1 verse 47. Then Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said about him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I'd like to hold to that name if I can. How do you know me, Nathaniel asked. Before Philip called you and you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathaniel responded, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And John chose seven miracles as a highlight reel of our Savior's work. The first was at the wedding in Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine, showing his control over time and matter in an instant, turning that water to wine. John 2.11 says, Here he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The fig tree thing, though neat, wouldn't hold a candle to the things that were to come. It was only the beginning. This first miracle represented new birth. The plain and ordinary made new and exquisite through the Son of God. The old made new, Jesus, when I met you, just like we sang in that song. The second was the healing of the official son. At this point, Jesus is becoming established, and he heals with a word over great distance, and the man walked away believing without even knowing if it had been done or not. He just believed because of the things that he'd heard he'd already done. He has to be able to do that. The third miracle was healing the disabled man. Jesus speaks healing and the man's paralysis is cured, his muscles made strong. It was an instantaneous physical therapy. Jesus also told him to go and to sin no more. And at this, the Jews began persecuting him for doing these things on the Sabbath. Because it seems like he always picked the Sabbath or it just fell on the Sabbath for him to do these things and that was offensive to them, so he just kept on pushing. And then he proclaimed that he was God, or he claimed God as his father, making them equals. And the Pharisees then decided this guy has to die before bringing God's destruction on us. And as we've studied this over the last few weeks, it's, 
I always knew that they were jealous of him, but I never really considered that it was historical that if people turned away from God, their nation would face calamity and destruction. So they weren't only afraid that he was going to take their high positions in the church, they were also afraid that they were going to be exiled again. Their nation would be destroyed by the Romans, they would be cast out to wherever. They were afraid on both fronts. And their fear outweighed reasoning and it clouded their judgment. And I feared going down the rabbit hole and naming examples of fear controlling one's good judgment in society today, so I just decided not to go there. <laughs> it says in John 5.25, Truly I tell you, an hour is coming and now is here, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. He was foreshadowing Lazarus' resurrection, but also telling us that we are dead in our transgressions, condemned to die as sinners, and feel sin's weight all the days of our lives. Alive and breathing, yet empty, hollow shells of what humanity could have been. Yet when he calls my name, I come out of the grave, out of the darkness, and to his glorious day. The fourth miracle was feeding the 5,000. Jesus revealed himself as the bread of life and the key ingredient for success on this earth. Jesus tests Philip by asking him a question he already knows the answer to. Before them stands a crowd of eight to 10,000 people, and Jesus asks, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? And Phil's flabbergasted. As he looks over the sea of people and responds, it's gonna take 200 days wages just to feed these people, and that's only a small amount of bread. That's not even any meat or anything. That's just a hunk of bread. That's all it is. And I've caught myself quick to anger and Christ has always corrected me, either through him or somebody that I really love, and it's super offensive, but I, I take it as his teaching. <laughs> Andrew then points out that there's a boy here with five loaves and two fish, but how far will that go with such a crowd, he asks. And Jesus said, you're gonna want him, you're gonna wanna have him sit down for this one. The miracle showed that Jesus, who is the bread of life, could be divided amongst all who are hungry for a savior, and there would still be enough left over for the latecomers. Amen. This miracle showed how he supplied for their needs. The people were so excited they were ready to force Jesus to be their king. But he wasn't to be the king of the world, not just he was to be the king of the world, not just in Israel. So he had to withdraw, he had to withdraw before they could force him to do that because he wasn't ready. He was to be the king of eternity, not just the king in that place at that time for their needs. So his disciples got in the boat and they traveled across and Jesus stayed where he was. This is in chapter six. So it says, when evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, hey, it's me, chill out. No, he said, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This miracle comforted the disciples. And the people in the crowd, figuring out that he had crossed the lake, they got into a bunch of boats and they followed him over there because they wanted to ask him more questions. And in John 6, 28, it says, what can we do to perform the works of God, they asked him once they found him. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. So my job as a created being, my sole purpose as I live is to believe in Jesus, that's it. But not only that, I need to live like him, follow in his ways, share with anyone willing to listen and defend my belief when necessary, even if I'm persecuted unto death. That's the goal, that's the job. We are to seek the spirit of God who will empower us to do the task. In John 6, 36, John chapter 6, verse 63, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. 
After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. And then there was a festival and he was trying to stay away from it, but his brothers were kind of like goading him like, hey, if you're trying to be recognized, you should go up there and perform miracles. If you're trying to be renowned, you need to go do this thing. And Jesus told them, my time has not yet arrived, but your time is always at hand. The world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Jesus ends up at the festival anyways, but he goes in secret, so nobody knows that he's there. Several times during the festival, they tried to seize him, but he did not stop proclaiming, The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit, for the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And in Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Jesus says in John 8, 32, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Pharisees defended their lineage in Abraham and the fact that they'd never been slaves. Jesus responded to this by saying, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son set you free, you really will be free. I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place among you. Truly I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. This confrontation with the Pharisees escalated to the point of them picking up stones ready to stone him to death. But then he was hidden and he left the temple. Things were getting pretty heated to the point where they're just wanting to kill him anytime he shows up. The sixth miracle was the healing of a man born blind, again on the Sabbath day, because it didn't matter to him. He could do the Father's work. That was the whole point. He, wasn't, he was supposed to be doing working for God. He wasn't supposed to be following the laws of man because those were irrelevant. Those were a bunch of made-up laws. that They were trying to keep themselves safe. They should have just stuck with the word. Opening the eyes of the people to himself as the Savior as he healed this man born blind, and the importance of keeping God's command, not man's. He healed the man and made him clean by rubbing mud on his eyes. I find that kind of odd how he did things. Everything was backward. Or he'd ask him, do you want to be well? <laughs> I've been laying here 36 years. That would make me very, very irritated, but yes, please. <laughs> The Pharisees asked the man if he believed Jesus to be a sinner, and he answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I, do, I don't know. One thing I do know, he, I was blind, and now I can see. John 10, 4, when he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. And that reminded me of the hymn, my sheep know my voice. Day by day they abide in the fold and go not astray. They love me because. So the sheep, the sheep analogy is, is very powerful. And then the reckless love of God. I always, we sing that a lot. He leaves the 99. Your love chases me, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. You're all safe together amongst yourselves in this group of sheep. And he will return, but first he must go and find the lost one. That is the goodness of our Savior. He doesn't count a majority win as victory. It is his will and desire that none should be lost. And even the Gentiles, he included us in John 10, 16. But I have other sheep that are not from the sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then, there, then they will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. And again, at this point, he stirs the crowd, claiming he and the Father are one and has to leave the region again because they're actively seeking to stone him. So every time he shows up now, it's just we need to kill this guy before he either takes our power or we get condemned because of him. And the seventh miracle was raising Lazarus from the dead, showing his control over life and death. We are all dead in our sin. Lazarus was literally dead. We are figuratively dead though alive and breathing. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. 
This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, you know, out of concern. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. I usually do good after a nap. <laughs> Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So Thomas had the right idea. He was figuring it out. We will die for you. We will die with you. You are the resurrection. This is, we got everything right here. We don't need anything else. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She had it right too. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept, knowing what he was going to do, knowing the plan. It was already all laid out. He'd already asked God. God had already revealed to him. And he still felt their pain to the point of weeping. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, couldn't he have opened, couldn't, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and the cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This final act in the end of his ministry brings the chief priests and the Pharisees to decide one man dies for the nation or the whole nation falls. Jesus says in John chapter 12, Now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Who should stop? We should stop asking 
Lord, why has this happened? And instead ask, Lord, how do I glorify you through this? There's sin in this world. There are things I can't explain. As I try to explain them, I tell myself that you are unfair and unjust. I don't want to think that way, Lord. Things are going to happen that are outside of my control, but how do I glorify you through those things? John 12:50 says, I know that his command is eternal life. So the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Jesus teaches us to love our enemies. Judas, Jesus washed Judas' feet with the rest of the eleven. Knowing what he was going to do, knowing he would be betrayed, he still got down and was a servant, showing them the true leader by being the servant. It's the Father's will that none should perish, no matter how evil and corrupt some people are. Sometimes I think I want the Bidens and Obamas and Pelosi's of this world to face justice, to face their judgment and subsequent punishment for their obvious blatant sins. Those people living selfish lives through false impulses, being led away by their sinful desires and taking comfort in the world's validation of their sin behavior and indulgence. And yet my Savior would have me have them repent and turn from their evil and accept redemption through his blood and sacrifice. All should be saved, even the ones I don't like. Hold forgiveness above condemnation. For Christ desires that all lost sheep be found and brought into the fold, that all would hear his voice and respond. Imagine he called to Lazarus to come out and Lazarus said no. That's the reality of some of us on the earth. They've been called and they choose not to respond. They stay in the cave dead or pretend to be sleeping. Some ask for five more minutes, promising to get up and give a good solid effort after the fact. <laughs> but what if tomorrow doesn't come as it has for some we've lost or have known throughout our lives and lost? Time is far too short to be making plans for a tomorrow not guaranteed. We need to live in the now. Be doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord don't be caught sleeping as the disciples were. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Let us operate in spirit and in truth. God can get things done, even through a people that don't want to do anything. It says in Galatians here, after my song. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So the law is something we need to follow, but we need to realize Christ is the law. We're following Christ in the way he tells us to interpret the law by reading our Bibles. A couple months ago, Elijah asked me, why did Adam and Eve have to eat the fruit and cause sin to come into the world? And he was adamant about it. It could have been easier. Why did, it, why did God let that happen? And this is a six-year-old. <laughs> I often contemplate the very question. But we receive God's mercy and Jesus' glory through the fall. And that's, it's hard to understand. It's hard to philosoph use a, point out a philosophy that makes sense, but it's biblical. And you need to just stick to the biblical truth of that fact. We wouldn't have known Christ, we wouldn't have known all the beautiful attributes of our Father in heaven if we had not known his Son. We receive God's mercy and Jesus' glory through the fall. Satan chose to honor and glorify himself, becoming equal to God or trying to become. Adam chose to attempt to glorify himself, becoming equal with God. Jesus gave all glory to God and in doing so was glorified for all time. Sin was allowed so that God's master plan for redemption could be revealed through his son. We were taught in the garden how to sacrifice animals for the redemption of our sin. God sent his son, Jesus, to offer himself once and for all. The ultimate and final sacrifice, breaking the bonds of sin and death, that we can leave this life and go on to eternity with our Savior, with confidence and with praise. Bless you. <laughs> Big Daddy Weave has a song, I'm Alive, and it's, I was dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through the fire. I was living on the run. With my flesh lost in desire, I was drowning in the flood. But God, rich in mercy, 
You came to save me, now I'm alive. But God, strong and mighty, you reached down for me so I could rise, and now I'm alive. So we should live in Christ and remember that we are alive because of him. Though sometimes we feel like we're dead. Amen? Amen. <laughs>